I'm going to read this morning from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18-22. through 22. Listen to Peter's letter to the churches in Asia Minor. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. In order to bring you to God, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Church, would you hear what the Spirit is saying to the world? Maybe even to me, to you, to us. Amen. Thanks be to God. So last Sunday uh, at, the, at the Super Bowl, not just a great party and not just a great game, but uh, maybe you remember this. Before the game started and before the national anthem, we heard artist Andra Day sing what has been commonly, colloquially, colloquially called the Black National Anthem. Now, I got to say, calling it an anthem is a bit of a misnomer. Because if you listen to it, it's, it's actually a, a Christian hymn. The song is called Lift Every Voice and Sing. It is called a Christian, it is a Christian hymn, and, it, and actually there was legislation three years ago that was put into place to have it be recognized as a national hymn, not as the black national anthem, but as a national hymn. And the term black national anthem, it's been confusing for some and admittedly troubling for others. Just this week, I was at Calvin Seminary for my, for my class. I have a class every Tuesday afternoon, and I was having a conversation with someone who was confused by the presence of the song at the Super Bowl, and, and they said, kind of sarcastically, sardonically, well, I didn't know there was another national anthem. And this prompted a bit of curiosity in me regarding Lift Every Voice and Sing. I mean, I know the hymn, I know the lyrics. And to be honest, if you listen to the words of Lift Every Voice and Sing, it is a beautiful song, lyrically and melodically. Um, The Community Celebration of Diversity Monday Nights at the library is titled after this hymn, Lift Every Voice. I've appreciated the lyrics for years now, but truth be told, I wasn't all that familiar with the history of it, and I thought, huh, maybe there's an opportunity to learn a little bit, and, and I'm a pastor and I preach, so when I learn things, oftentimes you hear them. But the hymn was written in 1900 by James Weldon Johnson, and his brother J. Rosamond Johnson wrote the music for it. Uh, it was originally written uh, not, in, not as a melody, but more as a poem that 500 school children recited. The very first performance of Lift Every Voice and Sing was performed by 500 school children. Now, James Johnson, James Weldon Johnson was born in Florida. He was from Florida, uh, born in in 1871 in the late 1800s, and he was born in the Jim Crow South. He was born in in a time and place where black Americans were prohibited from participating as full citizens. Johnson wanted to write a hymn that reflected, that recognized the reality of all marginalized peoples. Truth be told, the, the, the desire of the song was not aimed at strictly or solely or only black Americans. It was not just black Americans, it should be noted. The title of the song was not Lift Black Voices. The title of the song is Lift Every Voice. And if you read through the hymn, it actually doesn't mention blackness or black persons. It recognizes the plight of forgotten and marginalized persons across time and space. The comment that was made to me has stood out. This person said to me, well, we shouldn't have two national anthems. We don't have two nations. And I've reflected on that. And I think at the core that that is absolutely correct. Absolutely. There should not be two national anthems. There aren't two Americas, or at least there shouldn't be, which actually was the intent of the hymn. The purpose of the hymn when it was written in 1900 was not to say that 
black Americans should be separate or segregated from white Americans. It was actually written to encourage the unity of all Americans, regardless of race, tribe, tongue. So yeah, there shouldn't be two Americas, but the unfortunate reality is that for black folks, especially in the segregated South for the first two-thirds of the 20th century, the experience of Americans was very different based on the color of your skin. Black Americans couldn't eat at the same restaurants, drink from the same fountains, swim in the same pools. Do you guys remember that first season of Mr. Rogers when Fred and the mailman dipped their feet in a pool together? That was a shattering moment to have a white person and black person swimming in the same pool together because the segregation of the American public pools was really troubling. In 1917, the NAACP dubbed the hymn the quote-unquote Negro, an- Negro National Anthem, not as a way to say, I might add, that black Americans wanted a separate America, but merely as a reflection that the segregated America that was experienced by black persons in the early 20th century, it was not the same America that was experienced by white persons. It was legislated differently for them. Rather than making a case for a separate America or a separate nation for black Americans, the Negro National Anthem was recognizing that there was a different America for black Americans There just was, and it was actually a call for unity among all Americans. That was the hope. But it was written from the place of and written for the encouragement of persons who had been marginalized, persons who had suffered, persons who had been maligned. I tell the story of Lift Every Voice and Sing Today, not simply because it is Black History Month this month, but also because the song and the story connect connect deeply in our reading from 1 Peter. The story of Lift Every Voice and Sing is a helpful comparison for what the Christians were experiencing in what is now known as Turkey when St. Peter wrote his letter to them. Peter wrote a letter of encouragement to Christians who had been marginalized and who were facing real persecution, actual persecution, who were truly marginalized. This is how he begins 1 Peter, a bit of backstory on on 1 Peter as a letter. He begins it by saying, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. Do you know what it means to be sprinkled with his blood? It means to suffer like he did. And he writes this letter to the exiles. The exiles. Now, these exiles were not necessarily geographical exiles, though maybe that were the case, but it wasn't strictly a geographical exile of being displaced from one place to another. They probably haven't been lifted up from their homes or their countries all that much. More than being just geographical exiles, these First century Christians in Asia Minor were social exiles. That is, because they are Christians, they have been removed, exiled, dispersed from participating in civic life. Even facing real persecution, at this time not government-sanctioned persecution yet, that's to come, the fun is still coming. But these exiles are a marginalized people on account of their faith in Jesus Christ. They're not welcomed at every table. Not every door is open to them like it is to everyone else. They weren't allowed to shop at every store. They cannot work in specific places. Certain jobs were prohibited from Christians because at that time there were professional guilds. If you worked in a trade, there was a guild for that trade. In order to work in that trade, you had to be a part of the guild. Now, every guild had an attached deity to it. 
And to be a part of a guild was to give worship to one of the Roman deities. So what happens if you're a Christian and a monotheist and you don't, you don't worship these alternative deities? And you want to work in this trade where you're supposed to worship this god in this guild? Well, you're just not allowed to work there. They will prohibit you from, worship, from working there because you refuse to worship the guild's deity. They weren't welcome to work every place. I also, I might add as a side note that I think even still today in some professions, you have to worship a deity that's other than God in order to work in that field. But that's maybe a separate message. These are social exiles. They're exiles that have been marginalized on account of their faith in Jesus Christ. He calls them later in the book in chapter 2, he will call them aliens and exiles. He's writing a letter to aliens, or another way that it has been called is that they are resident aliens. They belong, but they don't. They are citizens, but they're not. Not unlike the situation of black Americans who were deemed at one point three-fifths of a human being under the three-fifths compromise. You see, these folks were citizens of Rome, but had been prohibited from participating in the privileges and the rights afforded to to them by their citizenship because of their faith. They weren't desiring to establish a separate nation within the Roman Empire or Asia Minor, Turkey, at this time. But Peter recognizes that the Rome that these Christians experience It's a very different Rome than what other non-Christian Romans are experiencing. Again, not unlike black Americans during Reconstruction and Jim Crow, even up to the present day, there was a different experience, a different existence for these Christians in Turkey. And in fact, this is why I chose the song Lift Every Voice and Sing today. In in chapter 2, St. Peter says to these Christians in Asia Minor, You are, y'all are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Peter isn't saying to them when he calls them a royal priesthood or a holy nation, he's not saying to them that, that, that they need to live a segregated life from everyone else in Turkey any more than lift every voice and sing was calling for a segregated state here in America. Peter is saying instead, hey, your experiences here are very different than non-Christians' experiences here. But don't forget, you are God's own people. Even if the world around you doesn't recognize you or give you value, you are God's holy nation. He calls them a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And I think Romans could say of Peter's letter to the Christians in Asia Minor, well, I wasn't aware that there were two nations in the Roman Empire. I thought there was the Roman Empire, but here you're saying there's a holy nation? Romans could have said of St. Peter, well, all this talk of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, I don't know, brother, that's kind of divisive. I don't know. What are you saying, Peter? It's a little divisive there, brother. The aim and intent of Peter's letter to the churches in Turkey at this time is not division or segregation. What Peter's doing is recognizing that people are suffering. People are suffering. Their dignity is being taken away from them. They are being considered less than. Why? On account of their faith. And do you know what Peter's response is in the face of all of this suffering that they're experiencing? Well, that's why we read what we read today from chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Notably, notably, I want to say not just what he does say, but also what he does not say when they suffer, when they face persecution. Notice that there is not a whiff, there is not a sniff, there is not a breath of retaliation. Peter does not tell Christians who are being persecuted in their own country, well, hey, you got to fight back. 
you need to take back the positions of power. He does not say that they should seek the destruction of their enemies. Nor does he say that they should fight for seats of power to change the situation. Now, historically, that will happen in a few hundred years under Constantine. But at this time, Peter's word to the churches who are suffering is this. Jesus is with you. That's his word to those who are suffering, is Christ is with you in your suffering. A reading today started with this really important little word in there. It says, Christ also suffered. You know what that also means? Christ also suffered for, for sins once for all. The people who are suffering are reminded that Christ also suffered and that his suffering was for everyone. Does all mean all? That there is not a human being for whom Christ did not suffer. Now, when, when we're in the midst of our own suffering, I don't know about you, but it can sure feel like God is far away from me. I don't know about you, but when I have seasons that are really challenging and really difficult, it can really feel like, where are you, God? How long, O oh Lord? And those are perfectly biblical sentiments as well, I might add. When we experiencing suffering, good night, we can wonder where God is in the midst of it. Here's Peter's word to the people who are suffering. Christ suffered with you. Where is God when we suffer? Where is God when we're lost? Where is God when we're alone? God is right there with us. Now, let's be honest here. The word of comfort here is not that God takes away our suffering. The word of God here is not that God will save us from experiencing loss. Or that God is going to circumvent these really, really dark moments of our life. St. John of Chrysostom, one of the ancient saints of the church, talked about the dark night of the soul. And how the good news of Jesus Christ is not that we don't have a dark night of the soul. Maybe it's that in the dark night of the soul, there's where we find Jesus. You see, the word of comfort for these suffering Christians in Turkey is not that God is going to free them from persecution. Jesus suffered to take away sin and shame. But that doesn't mean that Christians are now exempt from suffering ourselves. Peter said that Jesus suffered to bring us closer to God. Jesus suffered in order to bring you closer to God. And that perhaps our own suffering can be similarly used to bring us closer to God. You know, the, the traditional, the historical, the orthodox, lowercase o, orthodox, the proper belief of the church throughout history Orthodox understanding of holiness is that there is no sanctification without suffering. And this is what Peter is talking about when he brings up Noah. Notice that he does not say that Noah was saved from water. Wouldn't that be nice? Noah was saved from the waters. He wasn't saved from the flood. He wasn't saved because he avoided, he bypassed, or circumvented the, the treacherous waters of the flood. He wasn't saved from it. Water here being a representation of the suffering experienced by these Christians in Asia Minor. He wasn't saved from, he was saved through. Now that's a big difference. Eight people were saved through water he says. It wasn't the avoidance of the difficult season that God saved Noah and his family. It wasn't around all this really, 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 really hard stuff that God saved these eight people. 
Peter likens baptism to the tumultuous waters of the great flood. And when Jesus is baptized, what happens immediately after? We read earlier from Mark chapter 1, Mark loves the word immediately. That's one of his favorite words in all of his tes- in all of the gospel, in all of Mark. And what does Mark say after Jesus' baptism in verse 12? It says, And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Immediately after he's baptized, he's sent into the wilderness for 40 days. Where, we might add, he is tested by the deceiver. Jesus, apparently, doesn't ignore the suffering. I mean, we see this on Good Friday on the crucifixion, right? Jesus doesn't bypass the hard. Jesus doesn't go around the wilderness. You know how nice it would be to just be like, oh, hey, there's the wilderness. I'm going to go this way. Jesus doesn't go around the hard. He goes through it. Jesus doesn't bypass the cross. Do you know what he said the night before his crucifixion? Lord, Father, if you can take this cup from me, please do it. It's not that he wants to be crucified. It's that he knows that the way to resurrection is through the cross. God saved through water. Apparently, so is it with our own baptism. Our baptism, which is apparently like the flood, the waters of Noah, it brings salvation in that in in our own baptism. We are sharing in the death of Christ. Baptism is a way to recognize that we step into the suffering of Jesus we enter into the grave with Jesus so that we might somehow be raised into his resurrection. One of my favorite war memorials in Washington, D.C. is the Vietnam War Memorial, and I think I've mentioned this before, but when you're looking at the Vietnam War Memorial from a long way off. It's a pretty simple memorial. It, it, it's not a towering, I don't know, a, a blisk or anything. When you look at it from afar, from a long way off, I think from the West, you, you look and what you see is people walking into the earth. The Vietnam Memorial is a cut in the ground with the names on one side of those who, had, who were casualties of the war. But as you look at it from a long way off, what you see is people walking into the earth. And the architect was communicating something when he created the Vietnam War Memorial. He was saying, hey, as we remember those who served in Viet- Vietnam, don't remember that as you look at their names, you're going to the grave. You're entering into the earth. It was his way of saying that war is hell. Baptism is a going into the waters. Not unlike going into the grave at the Vietnam War Memorial, where it is a tacit acknowledgement of our entering into the grave, our suffering with Jesus, not avoiding it, not going around it, going through it. See, baptism is a holding on to the Word of God even when we suffer because we know that our suffering is not in vain. But perhaps suffering is the very means by which God is saving and sanctifying us. Baptism maybe even is a tacit acknowledgement of God's salvation. God saved, through, God saved Noah through water, through the tumult, through the suffering, through the chaos. So is God saving these Christians in Asia Minor through water, the waters of baptism. God is saving them through their present sufferings, through their public ridicule, through their civic marginalization. 
In fact, it could be that suffering is actually the fertile ground for God's sanctifying grace. Now, that is not to say that God desires suffering or wants people to suffer. But it is to say that God's goodness is so good that God can transform even the deepest and darkest suffering through his grace. Now, church, I don't, I don't know what sufferings you're all facing. Not all of you. I know what some of you are facing. Some of you have let me in enough. And, and I know that there are more than some here today who are facing their own waters their own tumult and chaos and questions. This week, we've received quite a few serious prayer requests that are really challenging circumstances. We're praying this week for Pastor Gabe and Teresa on the loss of his stepmother. Some of you are taking on really challenging Lenten practices that are leading to some physical, emotional, professional, and spiritual adversity. And for some of us here today, maybe we haven't even been able to vocalize the tumult and the grief that we're facing. Maybe we've even struggled to say it out loud. But the good news on this first Sunday in Lent is not that God will part every sea and that God will provide dry ground through every river. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Maybe sometimes. Maybe sometimes. But the good news is not that God takes away the waters or makes a way around the waters. The good news is that God makes a way through them. Through them. You see, the watchword of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement at that time was this. This was the the watchword for them. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Now, I'm telling you, if those waters are parted, there seems to be a way, right? If there's a bridge over troubled waters, there seems to be a way. The watchword was not God will make a way when we need him to. It's that God will make a way when there seems to be no way. So when you're in the waters, God's saying, I will go with you. And this is, these are the lyrics of the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It says, sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past. Till now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. You see, this hymn is a song of the suffering. It is a song of hope for those who have experienced adversity and loss. It is a song that says, y'all, we've been through it. You guys ever been through it? Any of you in it right now? It's a song that says we've been through it. And while God didn't take that suffering and that sorrow and that loss away from us, God has surely been with us in it. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Because that is the good news, church. No, I can't. I I can't sit here and tell you that God is going to take away every burden of your life. I can't. In fact, it was the Spirit that sent Jesus out into the wilderness. Thanks, Spirit. And Paul testified that God would not take away the thorn in his flesh no matter how many times he asked. He said, God, I'm still struggling with this thing. And God said, I know. Come to me. I know. Draw near to me. I can't tell you that God is going to eliminate every hurdle and rock in your path. Wouldn't that be nice? You see, when God makes a way, and God does make a way, God doesn't always make a way around or over. He makes a way through. You see, God does not save 
from water, God saves through the waters. So whatever waters you're wading in right now, whatever waters your neck deep in right now, whatever waters you're treading in just to keep your head above water, know this. Christ also suffered. Know this. Christ is with you and makes a way through them. And he's so good, he's so good that he can use them to bring you closer to him, closer to purpose, closer to meaning, closer to peace. So I don't know what waters you're facing right now. Maybe you're looking over the edge of the waters and you're not sure, do I take the plunge? Maybe you've started to get into the waters and you feel them crashing against your kneecaps and you know, oh boy, we're going to get in here. Maybe you're just all in. Maybe you're neck deep just with every breath and every stroke pushing through right now. I don't know where we all are here today, but I do know that God is with you. And that God saves us through waters. That also means we need to follow the Spirit even into the wilderness moments, which is what we do during Lent. So church, God saves us not always from the hard things. God saves us through them. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today. And I hope we know.